So today, over the next half hour, I'm going to talk through a story of uh, a day in the life at a previous consultancy that I was at in a way that we're able to really um, move forward with our security posture as a consultancy and take it to clients and really drive things forward in a very kind of cloud native, cloud centric way of looking at the world. I'll kick off with probably the one thing that everyone remembers from this talk, which is this amazing Japanese word that I absolutely love. Now, whenever I've done this in person, normally I ask the crowd, obviously, alas, we are still remote as the default here. But one of the things that I really like about this is it's a truly amazing word. And the definition is this. So, shujigiri. And the actual definition is trying out a new samurai sword on a random passerby. Now, this is based on Japanese history. This was something they actually used to do. And it was with this ethos, this mindset, this approach that we went into the day. Unfortunately, I have to do an obligatory about me slide, for which I apologize, but who am I? I'm Josh Armitage. What do I do? I'm the AWS practice lead at Contino, and we are a digital transformation consultancy based in the UK, in America, in Australia. And also, I am writing a book, the Cloud Native Security Cookbook with O'Reilly. If it's just 10% as successful as Team Topologies, oh, I will be oh so very happy. What this was really about, and often in security, they always talk about shift left, you know, shift everything to the left. And I don't talk about tooling, but what I really found was interesting with this, it was all about the prospect of shifting left learning. Now, there is, Kelsey Hightower often says that there's no compression algorithm for experience, but you can change when you get that experience in the life cycle. You know, I think everyone will have seen a graph that looks like this, where cost goes exponential over time. And when you're talking in a security sense and you're moving fast and you're becoming a, a DevOps organization and you're moving quickly, you know, being able to pull learning to the left, does that have the same benefit in terms of saving cost? The answer is yes. And we'll kind of get into that as we go along. But L learning late at the time of a crisis when something has gone wrong is the worst time to learn. And to help this, I'm just going to go through a few mental models that I like to use when thinking about these kind of things. So hopefully they might help kind of uh, help you understand or think in a way that kind of really elaborates on this topic. The first is a US Secretary of Defense called out that there's three kinds of knowledge that exist. There's known knowns, there's known unknowns, and there's unknown unknowns. So known knowns are the thing you know you know. Simple. Known unknowns are the things you know you don't know. And then you've got unknowns un unknowns, which are the things you don't know you don't know. Often in a crisis or a time of pressure or when you do something new, it's the unknown unknowns that are really valuable things that you learn because the only way you can discover them is by taking action and going forward. And that was really, again, part of what this day was all about. So the day, what we did on the day was we were a surprise red team and everyone else in the company got turned into a surprise blue team. So we took a day at this consultancy, there's about 30 people working at it at the time, and we brought everyone together. Now, everyone apart from the C-suite and the red team, which is me and another engineer called Will, everyone else thought we were going to just be hacking away, having a hack day on random ideas and products, consulting accelerators, all that kind of good stuff. What we knew, the three C-suite officers and the red team, was that we were actually going to attack our own AWS environment to see how everyone else would react in that scenario and how they would move forward. And within that consultancy, within a lot of companies, there's a bunch, when it comes to security, there are a lot of things that we know we know, or at least we think that we know that we know. One of those is security is everyone's responsibility. Security is not just the security function's responsibility to make everything secure. It really relies on everyone having a good understanding and moving forward together and having that kind of base level of competence in security. Otherwise, 
you know, people fall for phishing scams and all those kind of classic things, but it really is something that everyone has to be mindful of. The second was that we had a defined incident response process. Again, every any every and any company of any kind of size will have an incident response process. What happens when there's a security crisis that happens? We knew we had one. We didn't know whether people knew it, whether they'd read it, whether when it came down to it, would they know what it was? Would they even go and look for it when something happened? The third one, and this seems like an absolute luxury in the modern day, but this was a couple of years ago, that as a consultancy, we're naturally distributed across many offices across the city and also we're actively working on clients. So what we did, as I already mentioned, was we had a company day where we pulled everyone together and pulled them into the same room. We didn't want um, Slack and everything else to kind of get in the way of people communicating. The reality of the situation is people in a room do communicate at a higher bandwidth, and we didn't want that a lack of bandwidth to be an extra complication on this. When you're thinking about science experiments, you try and constrain the variables. You've only got one variable you're changing, so you can actually get some kind of correlational causal, causal relationship between them. If you have many variables, it gets really hard to think about. So that was one thing that we pulled everyone together in a room. Again, I know that seems like such a luxury nowadays, but it was something we really wanted to do. The last thing that we thought we knew was we thought the expected avenues, like when this red team scenario happened, we thought we knew how things would go to a degree. We thought we know who would take lead potentially, we thought we knew how they would try and access things. We knew what tools we had in place. Like often with this, these kind of security things, you want to make it compelling. You want the red team to know just as much about the environment as the blue team. And when you look at the stories of hacks throughout history, like OSINT, as it's called, is a key part of that. People do their research if they're really serious. So we understood how the AWS environment was structured. We knew what the tools were around. We knew all these things. And that really helps when you're trying to run one of these kind of events. Okay, the known unknowns. What did we know we didn't know? Or what did we know we wanted to find out through this? How do you measure performance in a red team activity? That was something that we kind of had to sit down and think about at length and just make sure that we got the right performance measures. And when I talk about performance measures with this, you need to be careful that the performance measures are about measuring where you are. They're not about saying what's good or what's bad. They're just about measuring where you are today. And where you are today is where you are today. There's no point in trying to label it as good or bad. But if you have these measures in place, if you do it again, you can say, are you better? Are you the same or are you worse than last time? And really, it's about being better tomorrow than you are today. You're taking this investment with the idea that your security posture will get better from that day and every day forwards. And setting up some kind of measures allows you to do that. So we came up with three. For this, not to have you know 100 different numbers to look at, but three kind of key performance metrics that we wanted to focus in on. The first was the time to identify. How long from us starting a red team activity did it take for people to even notice that something was wrong? Pretty key, right? If you can't see that something's happened for a day or two days, you're in a much bigger problem than if you see it after 10 minutes. The second was time to contain. So from when the red team event started, how long until all our access got removed? Now, when you're in the cloud and you're thinking about security and all this kind of thing, you still have the network perimeter, which is kind of the old way of thinking about security. It's often based around network perimeters. In the cloud, you have the concept of the identity perimeter. And everyone has some semblance of identity in the cloud if they're doing anything to it. So really, one of these was critical. When, when was kind of the identity perimeter re-secured? When was it that those of us in the red team had no more access? Our identities have been revoked, and anything else we've done along the side have been caught. And the third metric was the percentage of the intrusion detected. Now, again, in the cloud, when you're going through, and it is an, an amazing platform that really allows you to move quickly, but that kind of comes as a double-edged sword in this scenario. Like you can build a lot of stuff, create a lot of stuff all over the world incredibly quickly. 
amazing for productivity, quite bad in a security sense, right? Like, were our guardrails in place, with the locks in place properly? So when we finished the red team side of the day, how much of all the stuff we deployed and built and created and changed throughout AWS was the blue team able to find? Especially knowing that they outnumbered us 10 to one. One of the other things we really wanted to find out was who will take responsibility. Now, often in teams and in businesses, there are the go-to people in a crisis, right? There are the people you know that everyone's gonna go to when things starts to go wrong. We were mindful on this between the three C-suite officers and myself and Will, you took a lot of the seniority out of the room. You took a lot of the people that, the people people would look to in a crisis, they were not there physically present in the room. Now I said we did co-location. We all got together in the office on the day and the red team and the three C-suite officers, we actually went next door to a coffee shop and we did all the hacking from there. So we physically weren't present. And we really wanted to know when it came down to it, who would be the person to take charge, take the ball by the horns, any other uh, metaphor that's overused and see from there. Another thing we had was processes generally break once you scale up to three times where you were. And I mentioned the instant response process and all that kind of stuff. That was written when the company was about eight to 10 people. We were now 30 people. We had a feeling that a lot of the processes and things that were built when it was 10 may not work now and may need modification and changing to kind of take into account the new reality of where the company was at. And the last one, this is quite a personal one for me because I talk about it way too much, but what lenses do people possess? Now, this is a DevOps conference, so there's gonna be a lot of developers, a lot of operations people in the audience, maybe not that many security people. And when it comes to it in a high performing, when you're high performing organizations and teams, when you've got the T-shaped people that are always talked about, that you can be an amazing developer, but you need some level of competence in security and operations to be able to work in these high performing teams, really. And you have these different lenses, like a developer will look at a problem differently to an operations person, will look at it differently to a security person. Now, over time and through these kind of days and scenarios, you can look to give people different lenses to be able to look at the problem different ways with the idea that they end up a better solution because it's gone through more kind of filters and more ways of looking at the problem, looking at the world. So you don't end up something that's incredibly performant, but is a security nightmare. We don't end up with something that is amazing from a security point of view, but can't actually serve customers. So as people have more lenses, they're able to do more things and arrive at better solutions that better serve the business at the end of the day than some siloed kind of blinkered way of looking at the world. And then unknown unknowns. So obviously, by their very definition, we didn't know what these were going to be when they found it, but we kind of took a bit of inspiration from chaos engineering. And I guess I hope that some people are quite familiar with the concept in the audience today. The idea of put your system through hardship and see what happens, and that allows you to build a more, more resilient system. Now, that's effectively what we did, but the system was the people as opposed to some actual technical system. So we wanted to understand what happens if we introduced chaos, in this case, security chaos, into, into the team, what would happen in this scenario? So I think it's quite interesting how you can always draw these analogies across domains and kind of end up at the same concept actually works. And since I did this day, and completely unbeknownst to me, O'Reilly did actually publish a book called Security Chaos Engineering, which is effectively this whole concept. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, it is definitely something where these analogies can be drawn back and forth. Um, what I think is also important is that you draw up rules of engagement for this. This is something that the CEO was very, uh, very insistent that we do. And, that, you know, in this kind of scenario, there's certain things in a cloud environment that you could make it so the blue team pretty much can't do anything. What was really critical for us on the day is you wanted to make sure that you only stay like one or two steps ahead of the blue team the whole way through. You don't want to run so far 
forward that everyone they like kind of give up like oh you know we're we've lost control completely the idea with these kind of scenarios is everyone should come out of it with a positive experience at the end of the day that's really the goal everyone should come out having learned something and feeling really good about the day not don't they shouldn't be used as a way of making people feel really bad about their skills or their technical competence or anything else this is really about how do you get that positive experience for everyone because that's how you build momentum going forward and you build it as something that people care about or excited about in the future, not having some kind of bad reaction to the memory of this day when you're actually hacking everything else. So when you're doing this pressure bit, you wanna make sure you get the right level of pressure that it gets the right reactions, but doesn't become too overbearing. With that, let's actually move on to the day. So we're gonna go a timeline step-by-step step through the entire red team activity with all the bits and bits we learned along the way. So 10 o'clock in the morning, we decided to start. Now we all work in tech. I don't think it's um, unfair to say that generally let people's coffee kick in in the morning. If you do this, don't start at seven o'clock in the morning. You'll be very, very unpopular. So instead we kind of let people settle, get into the day and everything else and have their coffee, the caffeine's kicked in, people are alert. Okay, now's the right kind of time to do this. Another core thing we wanted to make sure we did through this, and this is again coming back to positive experiences and learning, is we wanted to channel the learning through the right people. Now, I've already alluded to the fact that there's go-to people in a crisis that generally exist in most teams and most organizations. What we wanted to make sure didn't happen on this is the most senior people jumped up, got on their laptops, and all the junior people kind of stood back and just watched them work. I've already spoken about the identity perimeter. The one thing we did before this started, the, at that 10 o'clock, that initial salvo, is we killed access for all the senior people left in the room. All the people with 10 to 15 years experience, that kind of stuff, you know, well-worn hands at the wheel, we wanted them to not be able to actually do anything in AWS. We left all the junior people, they hold, had all their access there still. And this way, the senior people had to kind of act on the cloud through the junior people. So to make sure that everyone got involved and everyone was used and the junior people felt that they would be involved because there was no other way for it to go forward. They had to be involved. And we don't want the senior people under pressure to kind of not forget about teaching people I move mean, purely to kind of damage control. So three minutes after we um, took away a lot of access, the next bit was, okay, how can we trigger alerts? How can we make it so people actually know something's going on? So as a purely serverless consultancy that we were, we actually had alarms that went off if anyone actually started up an EC2 machine in AWS or a virtual machine. So naturally, uh, we did that because we knew that would actually alert people to the fact that something was going on. Also, at the same time, we sent a phishing email that was crafted to look like our compliance tooling. The same thing that was going to complain about the EC2 machine being started, we sent in a phishing email out as them with as much of a facade as we could and went through that as well to see how that went. Unfortunately, a few people clicked it, but that's not a problem. That's just a teaching moment. That's somewhere we can move forward together. It wasn't about hitting people for having clicked a phishing email, but understanding what led them to do it and how can we help them in the future. Six minutes after that, someone went on Slack and said, okay, something's going on. Could someone give me a hand with this? And this was a guy called Paul, who I'll name because I will mention him quite a bit as we go along. A minute later, he realized that his AWS access wasn't working, so he asked for someone to come and give him a hand. And Zainab went over to help him. Zynab's access got instantly killed. The instant she put her hand up to go say, oh, I'm gonna go help, we killed her access as well. Now you might go, how did we know? I've already said we were next door. How did we know this was going on? And it was a fly, we had a fly on the wall. We had a double agent in the room who was telling us what was going on. We had, yeah, a double agent on the blue team who was able to feed us information back and forth. And this was critical to make sure that that pressure level I talked about was maintained at the right level, that people weren't getting too stressed, nor was it getting too easy, but make sure we could keep it at the right bit so people felt they were able to do something and they were making progress, 
without making it super, super stressful. So two minutes after that, Paul went into Slack and went, this is, this is not a drill, something's going on, everyone down tools, everyone needs to look at this right now, this is, this is crucial. Five minutes after that, the CEO was called. Now, I bring this up because this was actually step one on the instant response plan. So it took 17 minutes from us starting something and notice and everything else to actually get to step one of the instant response plan. As again, as I say, people don't always read it or they, that's not the first thing they think to go to when something happens. One of the things that we hadn't really thought about before, but then came very apparent is that the team's gonna self-organize around this. They're gonna end up with some pretty organic structure around this. So what actually happens was they got something that looked like this. Now imagine that's 20 people at the bottom going all into one person. And I think it's very obvious what will happen next. This, um, Paul's head set on fire. He lost control of what was going on. Um, you know, he started to really go, oh, I'm can't, I can't control this. I don't know what's going on anymore. So at 1028, it was stop and regroup. Okay, let's figure out, let's get a plan together. Let's stop everyone running off in a million directions, but let's, let's actually try and plan what we're gonna do. And at half past, it was, uh, who still has access to AWS? <laughs> because a lot of people had had theirs taken away. There were still a few people that had it, we were leaving alone, but just this allowed them to kind of split off into little teams based around one person who had access to AWS and a bunch of people supporting them. Seven minutes after that, they ended up reorganizing into a comms role, leader role situation. So Paul was still leading, thinking about what the plan was going to be, but all information was then filtered into Zynab, who would then take the information and pass the pertinent bits along to Paul as opposed to having him overloaded anymore. And from this point, we really noticed kind of an uptick in the blue team's capability to kind of fight back. Four minutes after that, um, our fly on the wall got kicked out of the room because they were like, why aren't you helping to our double agent? And he didn't really have a good excuse as to why he wasn't being particularly helpful. And at this point, we had actually told them that this was a drill. We didn't let them kind of just sit there kind of stressing about this being real, but we're like, okay, it's a drill, treat it as if it is real. And to be honest, with the level of competitiveness in the company, this probably made the blue team work even harder. Now they knew it was myself and Will they were fighting against. Seven minutes after that, we actually broke out of AWS. I found GitHub credentials. I went and started playing around in one of the other engineers' GitHubs in all private repos, of course. But you know, we actually managed to breach out of AWS. And normally, security posts often thought about AWS. You know, you need to make sure AWS credentials don't get out. But then the credentials end up having to go somewhere. So often they end up in in AWS. And one of this kind of came back to a thought I'd already I'd had before about the core component of AWS or GCP or Azure, they all have KMS, Key Management Service as a core service. Understanding how this service works and how to use it properly is fundamental for everyone that touches the cloud in any real sense. And it's something that often, you can use KMS to do what you want to do very quickly, but using KMS right from a security point of view requires a bit more thought. So this is just kind of one of those things you really need to make sure that people invest the time to learn or as a company, you invest the time to make sure they learn and they know this. Two minutes after that, we hit all silent on the Western front. They decided that um, they probably shouldn't be using Slack for communication, seeing as they knew the red team was also on Slack. So they went off to Google Hangouts and all communication went there and we no longer had any idea what they were doing. After that, um, you know, we decided to send the CTO and the COO back into the room because we needed to have that line of communication back. We needed to know how it was going in the room to be able to get that level of pressure there. And also it meant that the CTO could kind of step in and kind of say, hey, Paul, you've done an amazing job. I'm going to support you or take over from here and allow Paul to kind of de-stress and that kind of stuff. Because again, it was a case of we wanted everyone to remember the day fondly. At 10.57, like, okay, um, we think they've got us contained. 18 minutes later, they realized that they didn't because we were getting quite aggressive with what we were doing, trying to be quite in their face to realize they hadn't really got a contain on us. And then five minutes after that, Will and I decided to uh, announce the fact that it was us. Everyone knew it was us already, but still we had some fun with it. 
because again this is about having a fun positive experience out of the day and eight minutes later the contain was real and 22 minutes after that will and i walked back into the room to a variety of hand gestures uh, from everyone in the room just quite a wonderful experience if you've never had ev everyone be quite rude to you when you walk into a room it's quite quite fun uh, again, all done with the best of intentions. Everyone was having good fun with it and everything else, but that, that was a memory I will cherish forever. And 10 minutes after that, we moved from containment to remediation. And so we already had, we had a line in the sand. If it got to one o'clock and we weren't contained at that point, we were just going to stop because you don't learn from experience. You would, you learn from reflecting on experience. So I wanted to make sure that the second half of the day was set aside for reflecting, making sure we learned everything, we got everything we could out of the day as opposed to just red teaming for an entire day and everyone would just go away exhausted, right? A core thing at the company and for me personally is this concept of Kaizen, change for good or continuous improvement. So how do we use what we did on that day to be better tomorrow than we are today? So let's kind of step back over quickly onto the metrics that we defined back at the start. So the time to identify, that was 12 minutes. Again, don't know whether that's good or bad or not, but it kind of um, doesn't, really, doesn't really matter whether it's good or bad, but now we had a mark in the sand. Next time we did it, we knew what we were trying to beat. Time to contain was an hour and 28 minutes, and the percentage of the intrusion detected was 66%, about two thirds of what we'd done. A question we got asked was, was this realistic? Was the scenario that we'd run realistic? And in our mind, it, it very much was. We tried to make it a realistic scenario. Effectively, everything we'd done could have been done by one disgruntled employee who had the address access that Will and I had. If Will or I had got angry or something or lost our credentials, everything that happened on that day could have very easily happened. I think I always come back to backups never fail, restores do. Just be, and this kind of comes back to the instant response process. Just because it's written down and people read it, it's only kind of in the heat of battle or when something's going on that you really test these things and you make sure that these things are right. Now, one of the important things, and I've been doing some reading around the time we did this, and it kind of got me thinking a different way about security, is this whole concept of the OODA loop. And if people haven't heard of it before, it comes from a US Air Force fighter pilot trainer called John Boyd, or 40 second Boyd as he was known, because he could beat anyone in a dogfight in 40 seconds. And what he always said was with the OODA loop, and you just step through four, you loop through four stages. So you've got observe, orient, decide, and act. And his point was, if you can go through that loop quicker than your opponent or the person on the other side, you'll be able to outmaneuver them because you're able to kind of work in cycles within their bigger cycle. And where this kind of became really relevant on this was the fundamental problem that I felt the blue team had was at the observe. The observability they had on the AWS environment was not good enough. It took them so long to figure out what was going on, what was where, what was happening, that as the red team, we were able to kind of keep going and keep going and keep going and go into different areas and kind of move away from where they were looking because they didn't have the right, really, the right tooling in place to be able to look at this. So naturally, off the back of this, they went and looked at what tooling can help solve, us, solve this area for us. Do we need to build it ourselves? Do we need to buy it? Whatever else. There was kind of, you know, it, it highlighted big gaps. And it's not the fact that the gap existed. was It's not a problem to have gaps. Every <laughs> Everywhere has gaps, right? But using this kind of way to show the gap and allow us to fix it was really critical. Um, and naturally, anything anyone said in terms of an improvement or an idea were captured. We wrote them on post that stripped them on the whiteboard. They all got chucked into JIRA. And then for almost the rest of the time, I think it's still going, is anyone who are a consultancy, so anyone ended up on the bench or a new starter, before you were on engagement or between engagements, you would be asked to go and chunk away at the security backlog. If you didn't have anything else kind of really pressing you needed to do, working on the security backlog just became a rite of passage at the company. So everyone, when I go back to security, it's everyone's responsibility. Everyone was working on security at this point. And you ended up on the bench, you ended up working on security tasks. 
also it became kind of a beginning of a tradition from this we ran internal and public ctf or capture the flag events um you know there's talks at conferences not just this one but other ones and the other people are involved in that kind of stuff it is still a story that is talked about with new starters and it's been over two years <laughs> And still new starters I've never even met if when I see them or talk to them, they're like, oh, you're that guy. And I'm like, what guy? And they're like, oh, the guy who did the red team stuff. I'm like, yes, yes, that's me. I think it's just these myths are what make a culture. And if you want to make things important and make it part of the culture, you need to take action. You can't talk about it. You have to do it. You have to, like, invest. Like, the company made no money on the day we did this, right? We pulled everyone off clients for this. That's how important it was to the company that effectively went, we're not going to make any money today because this is more important than that. And I'll just finish off with just one kind of final thought about red teaming and why red team. If you want to sell this into a business, which I quite commonly do, if you want to sell this into why this is important, um, I come back to a chess idea and a chess metaphor. The difference between a novice and a master when a novice looks at a chessboard, they see individual pieces, and that's the way they look at things. They see the individual pieces moving. When a master looks at a chessboard, they look in terms of chunks and patterns and everything else. They see the board a fundamentally different way that allows to bring them their experience to bear and move much quicker and see you know, into the future with ply or anything else. But that's really the, di the difference that sets them aside. Now, when a security incident happens for real, who do you want to see next to you? Do you want a novice or a master? Because that's fundamentally what red teaming in this style is all about transforming novices into masters. So when the crisis does happen, you're confident, you're composed, and you can move forward, not have everyone's head set on fire and it get 10 times worse. Thank you very much for listening to me. And we do, th thanks Josh, and we do have some questions for you. Yeah, sure. So. So the first one would be, what was the most, most surprising discovery? Uh, okay, so let, let's start with this one. Uh, what, <laughs> what's your take on the value provided by external versus internal red teaming exercises? So a lot of, a lot of the external red teaming I see is normally focused on pen testing at the edge. Um, I think this is slightly, not the pen testing applications at the edge isn't valuable, but the whole concept of this kind of red teaming exercise was based on the idea that you have holes in your security perimeter because everyone does. So rather than focusing on finding the holes at the edge and do that, it kind of goes one step further to assuming that hole has been breached. What do you do next? Which um, I think is quite hard to find in the red teaming or uh, external third parties that are really focused on what it means to use the cloud. I think there's still a bit of a learning and that they're on a journey there at the moment. I think doing it internally brings a sense of camaraderie and stuff like that and it becomes more it depends whether you have the right people in the company to do it i guess if you have the right people with the right mindset and the right approach who can do it and keep it fun and engaging and learning opportunity then i think stick it all internal i don't see the point of getting a third party in or at least maybe get a third party and do the first one but then when you go to do more try and keep them internal um because then you can rotate people through red team on both sides and everything else and i think it's more rounded learning experience but at the end of the day, I'd rather you did it than you worried about whether it was internal or external. I think it's just more important that companies make the investment to do this kind of thing um, rather than, you know, if you can get external people in to come and do it, then awesome. If you've got the right people internal, then awesome. Either way is good. Okay. And what was the most surprising discovery you got from the exercise? Um, I think it was the fact that people didn't think it was realistic that people like were honestly thought that this wasn't a realistic scenario. Cause I think often um, people who haven't been in the industry all that long, who haven't been through a security crisis or anything else, or haven't thought about it that way. when I come back to lenses and all that kind of stuff, the people without the security lens really, they think breaches happen to other people or other companies or anything else and all that kind of stuff. And really it's not about if a breach happens, it's when a breach happens, they will happen it's impossible to have perfect security. So I think that was the most surprising thing that people didn't think it was realistic um, for me. But I think everyone got something different out of the day, which was awesome as well. I think everyone learned something different or you know, learned something surprising um, on that way. But that was, that was my one personally. 
Okay, thank you very much, Josh. So right now we'll take a coffee break and then we'll be back with Ignite Talks. So stay with us. Thank you for having me, guys. Enjoy the rest of the conference, everyone.